Good morning, everybody. All right, so imagine this situation. You're uh, running a piece of software that's delivering video to everyone, and it's the World Cup. And suddenly, in the middle of this fantastic goal, the software just shuts down and stops. How happy is everybody? Not really. And really, what happened to Matt was he was watching Dancing with the Stars, and now he doesn't know who won. He's even more upset. So imagine that situation, and it all shut down for one reason. You were asked to write logs while you were um, running the service, and suddenly, logging just caused everything to stop. Now, in this scenario, we shouldn't be stopping the TV because we can't write logs anymore, right? So let's take a look at a little piece of code that can simulate this problem. And then I want to talk about um, a solution that I find really elegant in Go um, to solve that. So in order to um, simulate this uh, stoppage, we're going to build our own device. So there it is. There's our type. It's called device. We're going to simulate a problem. And we're implementing the I.O. writer interface so we can, uh, we can have some fun with this. And basically, if we have a problem, we're going to loop here for a second, and we're going to just put everything on hold. We can simulate this as potentially a disk issue, network, whatever it is. And if there is no problem, then we're just going to write the standard out as it relates to this simulation. So here we are. We're going to use 10 Go routines in this simulation. We're going to declare, create our device. We're going to use the standard library logger. I like using the standard library logger until I can't. This is usually what I try to use. And so we're going to create this logger. We're going to set the output to our device. And here we go. We're going to create 10 Go routines. And each Go routine is going to go ahead and write to the log and wait 10 milliseconds to do it. Now, down here, what I've done is I've allowed us to hook into the OS so I can hit Control-C and cause these issues to um, happen. and then get resolved. So here I am here in main.go. I'm going to build this piece of code, and we're going to run it. And we're logging. Everybody's fine. We're watching the World Cup. Life is good. And then, boom, every Go routine is now blocked on that right to log, and everything is just shut down. No longer can we use the standard library logger, because this is a potential situation. OK. Now, we might go ahead and fix the problem. Now logging is working again. But at this point, this program is now dead. All right. So what I want to show you is how can we solve this problem in the simplest way possible, leveraging the constructs that Go has? Well, let's write our own logger type and apply it to this code that we have here and see what we can do. All right, so we're going to create a, a, a package called logger. And the first thing that we're going to want to do is define a type, maybe called logger, struct type. Now, again, I want to keep this simple. And I think all we're going to need here now is a channel. The idea is we need to be able to detect when there's a problem so we don't hold these Go routines hostage. At the same time, we need to detect when the problem is gone, because logging is important. I mean, it's not more important than video. But it is important. I don't want to lose the, the logging that I don't have to lose. So let's do this. Let's create a channel of type string. And that's the data that we're trying to write to the log. And since we're going to be managing a Go routine, what we're going to do as well is um, use a wake root. So we'll see how all of this comes together. So for now, this is the type. We're going to have a channel to help us with some communication. And we're going to have a wake root. Now let's create that new function. It's pretty good practice to create a new function um, when you've got a type like this that has to be initialized. I usually call these factory functions. Now, we're going to need our I.O. writer because we've got to be able to use any type of device to write to. And again, I want to be able to leverage the device that we created. And the big thing here is to be able to use a buffered channel. The idea here is I want to implement a drop pattern, create a buffer of a particular size that defines what our capacity is. If we're under capacity in terms of what we can write, then let's do it. But if we hit capacity, which will happen pretty quickly when we have a problem, then we want to be able to drop things on the floor. Now, I don't know what the capacity should be, but we'll let the user tell us. And then we're going to return that logger value back out. So we're going to go ahead then in here, and we're going to go ahead and we'll create that logger value. 
Now, a wait group is usable in its zero value state. There's nothing there I have to do, but we are going to have to make this channel. Again, we're going to make it as a, a channel of type string, and we're going to use that capacity value as the size of our buffer. So nice here, this is all I have to do in terms of initializing this. The wait group is already set to go. Now, I need a go routine that's going to be actually doing the right. The whole idea is this go routine can block, but the rest of the go routines that are really servicing that, that video work can't. So let's go ahead and we'll, we'll create that go routine. All right. Uh, I always forget to make sure we make that call. So let's get some parentheses in here. Now, the first thing we want to do is to be able to feed off this channel. So we could do that with a for range loop. I want you to notice something as I'm writing this code. I'm not using any special libraries, third-party packages. I'm not even really using the standard library here. This is all part of the language itself, which is really helping us in terms of readability. So what are we going to range over here? We're going to range over this channel. Notice also here that I'm using closures. I like using closures. I think it also helps um, with readability when, when we're writing code like this. So we're going to range over this channel, and every time there's something to receive, we're going to pump this, this for range loop. Now, what are we going to do when we get this value? We want to write it to disk. So what's nice is the um, from package has an f print uh, f function, which will let us use our uh, writer, which, of course, I forgot to put a variable on. And we'll write to that, and we'll write that value there. And that's pretty cool. So now what's going to happen is every time we get a value, we should be able to just write that to disk. Boom, 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 boom. We'll get the next one. We'll just keep writing it. But we're not done yet, because there's one rule. If you're going to create a Go routine, um, you should really know when and how it's going to terminate. There are exceptions to that. But in general, we should know how and when this Go routine is going to terminate. And this is where that wait group is going to come in. So I wanted to use that wait group to be able to manage the um, this go routine here. So um, as you can see here, um, we're not using logger yet. So, oh, two Gs. There we go. This is what happens when you're live coding. OK. And once this loop is terminated, we're going to want to know that that happened too. So we're going to call done. And so the wait group is really nice. When you just have to track um, what's going on in terms of go routines, and you don't need in, any information back and forth. I love that wait group. It's really, really great. So here we go. We've got a Go routine. Its entire existence here is to stay in this loop, receive off of that channel. And once we close this channel, that loop will terminate. We'll call done on the wait group, and we'll know what's going on. The last thing now that we have to do is return um, that value back to the caller. OK, great. So we've got our factory function. It's all set up, but we're not done yet. We need two more things as part of this API. What we're going to do now is write that method for the close. And we can call it stop. We can call it what we want. Again, if we're going to create this code, we have to know when and how it terminates. And what's nice here is what we can do now is just close that channel. And then we can wait for that go routine to um, report that it's done. I don't need anything else here right now in terms of stopping. So in main, we can call stop, and we know that when this returns, uh, that Go routine is done doing. The last thing here, the key to this whole thing, is our um, print line function. So let's do that. And we'll just keep this print line simple, too. We'll just take a string. Now, how does print line not cause any blocking? Again, a really great construct here in Go is the select. So what we're going to be able to do is say, OK, case what? All right, we want to send um, something on this channel. The data that we want to send is right here. And we're going to have a default case. And we'll explain this in a second, default. All right, come on, what are you doing to me? You guys would think I can type, right? All right, now, what we're going to do here is just say drop so we can see it. So what's happening here is, if we can perform this send, if we're under capacity, if we're capable right now uh, to write that to the logs, then that select on 17, that case is going to be accepted. But if we're at capacity, we drop into that default case, 
and we just let this Go routine continue to go. What's really nice is once this Go routine up here is able to start handling logging again, we'll get capacity very, very quickly, and logging will happen again very quickly. And this is it. I got 40 lines of code here to handle this problem. So now that I've got my, my uh, new logger, let's come in here, and we're going to come back to that main that we had before. I've already got the import. And I've got that same device. I've got that same problem. All we're going to do differently now is still create our device, but instead of using the, log, the standard library logger, we're going to create our new logger, passing in our device, our capacity, which is 10. I'm going to have one piece of capacity for every Go routine. And the Go routine is still doing the same thing it was doing before. So if all this works out for us, what we're going to do now is, let's see where I'm at here. OK. Yeah. All right, so let's come into this path here. There we are with main. We'll build it. It built. We'll uh, run this piece of code. All right, so now we are. We're, we're streaming that video again. There it is. We're, we're watching everything that's going on. I'm going to control C, and as soon as I do, look how quickly that was. Immediately, we, we started having capacity issues. Literally right now, we're not able to log. Something is blocked on that device. But thanks to that select case, we we're able to detect it very quickly. And we're, we're still streaming video. We find out what the problem is, and we fix it. And now we're getting our logs again. I, I, I love this piece of code, because I really think it shows the power of, of these concurrency primitives being in the language. And when I'm teaching and I show people this, this type of code, they finally start saying, OK, I get it. I get it. Now, there's a lot to using channels. There's lots of different scenarios. There's lots of um, things. I just recently wrote a blog post. I've been thinking about this stuff for probably about six months. When do you use a channel? When do you use an unbuffer channel? You know, what, what are the scenarios around that? But this is a great use of a, of a buffer channel when you've got some defined, well-defined capacity. You could see, again, how quickly that channel gave us the ability to respond to that particular problem and be able to detect it and then be able to keep moving on. Thank you.